Hello and uh, welcome to Press TV's debate. I'm Marcy Hashemi. Thanks so much for being with us. While well, the leader of the Islamic Revolution of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, says U.S. officials are lying when they say that they are not seeking regime change and the Islamic Republic. He's told the commanders of Iran's air force and said that if the United States could overthrow the government of the Islamic Republic, they would. This as Iran is celebrating the 35th anniversary of the victory of its revolution. Why has the U.S. failed to win the trust of the Iranians and will the U.S. ever put an end to its antagonistic policies towards the country? Stay tuned as we take a closer look at the subject on this debate. Iran and the five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany are implementing an interim nuclear deal they reached in Geneva last year. Under the agreement, Iran is limiting some aspects of its nuclear energy program in return for the removal of part of the sanctions. The implementation of the Geneva deal is expected to pave the way for a comprehensive agreement between the two sides in a matter of months. Efforts and remarks made by some U.S. lawmakers and officials have undermined the spirit of cooperation that the international community expects to see on the part of both sides. Some U.S. lawmakers, lobbied by the Israeli group AIPAC, have been pushing for more anti-Iran sanctions, despite the ongoing dialogue. Tehran has said any such measure would kill the Geneva deal. Several top U.S. officials have repeated in recent months that all options remain open in dealing with Iran, indicating that America could use a military strike against Iran's civilian nuclear facilities if the talks fail. Iran has said such words disrespect the Iranian nation and will undermine the ongoing negotiations. In the latest remarks by U.S. officials, top U.S. nuclear negotiator Wendy Sherman said Iran's ballistic missiles have to be addressed in any comprehensive agreement with Iran. Iran has always said its weapons are defensive and will be used if it comes under attack. The country's defense spending is not comparable to that of some countries in the region. The leader of Iran's Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Khamenei, says Washington has not dropped its enmity towards Iran and has been insincere in negotiations with Tehran. به مجرد اینکه از آنها جدا میشن در بیرون یه جور دیگه حرف میزنن Ayatollah Khamenei also said U.S. officials lie when they say they're not seeking regime change in Iran. He said the United States would not hesitate if it were able to do so. In an apparent reference to Sherman's remarks on Iran's missiles, the leader said the country will never halt enhancing its defense capabilities. امریکایی ها در برخی از اظهارات و لفاظی هاشون میگن ما دوست ملت ایرانیم دروغ میگن دروغ میگن در خلال کارهاشون میشود فهمید ایران رو تهدید میکنن اون وقت توقع دارن که جمهوری اسلامی از قدرت دفاعی خود بکاهد این خنداور نیست این مسخره نیست Iran and the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, Russia, US, Britain, France and China plus Germany, are to resume the talks in Vienna later this month. The discussions will focus on a long-term deal. Time will tell whether the US approach, which Iran regards as insincere, will allow future talks to succeed. I'd like to welcome my guests uh, to the program out of uh, Tehran, Press TV's newsroom director, Mr. Hamid Reza Imadi, and uh, out of uh, Washington, D.C., senior fellow of the Hudson Institute, Mr. Richard Weitz. Thank you both for being with us. Well, let's start this off in Washington. Well, the leader of the revolution has said that the United States cannot be trusted. Uh, do you understand his concerns when he says this or not? Well, this is a, a statement that has been made by leaders of, m many uh, leaders of Iran and many leaders of the United States and other foreign countries. There is definitely a trust deficit on all sides. And that's why I think that these uh, negotiations on the nuclear deal will be difficult. But if an agreement is reached 
and implement it effectively, that should go a long way to help them break down this trust deficit. But, but do, you, do you personally, I'm asking your perspective, do you understand his concerns when he says uh, that uh, obviously there is, as you say, a trust deficit? Yes, I believe you could make reference, for example, to uh, U.S. ties with the, the previous uh, Iranian government uh, under the Shah and uh, other uh, developments that he would feel uh, to have been adverse to his interests. What about it, uh, Mr. Mondi? Uh, are there concrete experience over the last three and a half decades to make the uh, leader of the Islamic Revolution make such a statement? Well, I think it goes back to 1953 when the Americans toppled the democratically elected government of Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh, and then they um, uh, brought back the dictatorship of the Shah regime. And then when it came to the Islamic Revolution, they sided with and helped and funded and armed the Saddam Hussein's uh, killing machine. And then Saddam Hussein waged a war for eight years with the support of the United States and those Western countries that are now advocating human rights in every part of the world. And then the United States um, shut down a passenger plane, an Iranian passenger plane, killing women and children, as the U.S. normally does in many parts of the world. And uh, you see the sanctions, the illegal sanctions that the United States imposed on the Iranian nation and caused the death of a lot of cancer patients because of the lack of medicines and because of the, the problems that were caused by the sanctions. So, so there is every reason why Iran cannot and should not trust the United States of America. Well, Mr. Weiss, there are many that are saying that there are mixed signals coming out of Washington right now. On the one hand, uh, they talk about uh, some type of diplomatic reapproachment. On the other hand, we continually hear various officials from uh, U.S. President Obama on down to say that all options are still on the table. Tell me, what do you make of this schism or this paradox uh, coming out of Washington, and what do you think Tehran should make of it? I think it's inevitable that you see this in U.S. policies towards China, towards uh, uh, Russia, and towards other countries. There are clearly a large number of uh, influential countries, which includes Iran, of which Americans have divided opinion. I mean, there are elements of cooperation in our relationship. There are elements of conflict. And it's difficult to deal uh, in, in public. If you've got a common line you can adopt towards these kind of neither adversaries nor allies. Um, and so I think this, we're going to have this continue for a while, at least. Mr. Mahdi, do you think it's, it's, it's natural because what our guest in Washington is saying is that it would be obvious that you're going to have differences of opinion between individuals. But we're seeing some of the same individuals having differences of opinion from uh, Mr. Obama to Mr. Biden on down. One hand, they talk about this uh, diplomatic approach. On the other hand, they continue to have a very hawkish type of attitude. Well, yes, uh, it's, uh, you can see a lot of hypocrisy going on in the United States today, you know. Uh, just before the November 24th deal between Iran and the P5 plus one, uh, you can see the social worker turned uh, nuclear negotiator, Wendy Sherman, said in October 2013 that uh, it is, and I quote, um, we know that deception is part of the DNA. She simply insults the Iranian nation. You know, we are, we are a nation... Uh, we have stood the test of time for thousands of years. We stood united as a nation. We are the country that uh, created human civilization. We contributed to science and, uh, the, and history of, of mankind. And now we see a person who comes from a country that was, that was born just, uh, just several hundred years ago when our ancestors swam in uh, man-made made swim, swimming pools and my ancestors uh, developed the Charter of Human Rights. Europeans were living in caves, you know, and uh, now we can see somebody, somebody coming from that background is, is telling us that in your DNA, in, your, in our DNA, there is deception. And that person is the person who says something during the negotiations. And when the negotiations are over, <coughs> says something else just to appease the Israeli lobbies and the, the Zionists who are 
uh, funding U.S. Congress members. What about that, Mr. Weitz, when we look at uh, Ms. Sherman and those comments, at what type of comments would you say are those for someone who's actually uh, involved in negotiating uh, with, the, with this other country? Why do we see these type of comments coming from top-ranking officials? We're not just talking about man-on-the-street interviews, but we're talking about top-ranking officials in the U.S. administration. And do you think it has anything to do, perhaps, with the Israeli, the Israeli uh, lobby's influence on in American politics today? No, I think you see this kind of bifurcation in U.S. policy, as I said, towards China, Russia, and many countries, not just Iran. Um, and it's a function of the two-level game that these kind of officials have to play. They have two audiences, at least, they have to deal with. They have to deal with the foreign governments and, and make clear that they're open to cooperation under acceptable terms. And then they have to deal with their domestic audiences, uh, of which in Congress there's a strong group that's very suspicious of Iran and these other countries. And so it, in front of those groups, in congressional testimony, they're going to emphasize that they're cautious, they're not going to take anything without verification, not on the basis of trust alone, and so on. Whereas in negotiations privately with the foreign governments, I suspect they, they have a different tone. So, so how does Tehran know which U.S. policy, which one is real and which one is, um, I guess, just staged for various different audiences. How would they know which one is legitimate and which one isn't? Normally, what they're being told at the negotiating table is what the, uh, the, the official view is. Now, of course, any agreement we reach is going to have to be ratified by Congress. And that's going to where even uh, what they told the Iranian government that they would like to do this, this, and this, uh, it's possible that Congress will not approve. And so that's uh, a problem. And that's uh, it's something that we're going to... I mean, the Russians in particular have complained about this. They reach agreements with the U.S. and then the U.S. government isn't able to get them approved through the Congress. And so I, I, this is a problem with the way the U.S. political system works, though it is also a safeguard against the executive pursuing policies which are too different from those uh, preferred by the Congress of the American people. Well, Mr. Imadi, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei has said that dealing with arrogant powers will lead to nowhere or a dead end. Do you think that he was referring in general, or do you think that he was specifically talking about the recent nuclear deal, that perhaps trying to deal with these arrogant powers will basically get Iran nowhere? Well, actually, Ayatollah Khamenei said that uh, we are ready to interact with, with uh, the international community. And uh, it's very clear, Iran is doing that right now. You know, Iran is seriously engaging in negotiations with the P5 plus one. Iran is uh, trying to, to allay all the concerns that do exist and even those 